Nikki Haley, Joel Osment, we call her. Six cents, remember that one? I see dead people. <laughs> Yeah, that's what voters will say if they see you and Joe on the ballot. Oh, that, yeah, that's not very nice, Nikki. All right, that was a funny moment. Uh, Nikki Haley making an appearance on Saturday Night Live. She's got a lot of good laughs over that. Some people even zinged her for it. You can't win with these things. Nikki Haley uh, joining us right now, the presidential candidate. Governor, very good to have you. Um, that was brave of you to do that. Uh, sometimes it's mixed rewards. Would you do it again? Oh, it's a lot of fun. You know, the whole point of what's happening in our country is we've got to remember how to laugh. We've got to remember that everything doesn't have to be so serious. And so, look, it was a lot of fun. It was making fun of myself. It was making fun of Trump. It was, you know, trying to get him to debate me because he still refuses to debate me. And so it was just, you know, a lot of fun. And I think that if you can't laugh at things, then that says a lot more about um, what's happening in our country than anything else. Now, maybe in good humor, good fun, you have been zinging him lately on the grumpy old men theme to old guys going at it. You've had enough of that. He comes back as people come back. You're overdoing it. Other party types say you're hurting the party. And if he's the nominee, you'll, you'll, you'll damage him. What do you say to that? I think it's the hard truth. I mean, you can't have 70% of Americans who say they don't want a Trump rematch, Trump-Biden rematch. The majority of Americans dislike Trump. The majority of Americans dislike Biden. Both of those men put us trillions of dollars in debt that our kids are never going to forgive us for. And we've got a country in disarray and a world on fire. Are we really going to have our two candidates be two men in their 80s? When you need someone who can run eight years disciplined, focused, ready to get to work and get things done, that's not being disrespectful. That's just being factual. And then you go and you look at the fact that every single general election poll He's down seven points. He's down nine points on Biden. In some, he comes in margin of error. I defeat Joe Biden by up to 17 points. The poll that came out yesterday, I defeat him by 13 points. That's what this is about. There will be a female president of the United States. It will either be me or Kamala Harris. If, Dave, if Donald Trump is the nominee of the Republican Party, we will have a president, Kamala Harris. That's just a fact. Well, you know, even among Republicans, though, Governor, Donald Trump beats you fairly handily in favorability among Republicans, 47 percent to 34 percent. That's one poll you got. There are others that show him holding on. There are others that show now in, in some of these polls uh, that he's opened up. That is Donald Trump anywhere from a four to six point lead over Joe Biden, again, depending on the poll. So he is kind of close to sharing your type of advantage over Joe Biden. Again, depends on the poll. So is that draw that you have not as much of a draw? Well, I mean, I think if you're showing national polls, that doesn't take into account the state by state races that we have. You know, we started with 2 percent in Iowa. We ended up with 20 percent. We had 14 candidates in the race. A dozen of the fellows are gone. I've just got one left. Mm -hmm. We ended up getting 43 percent of the vote in New Hampshire. Think about that. The Republican incumbent, Donald Trump, did not get 43 percent of the vote in New Hampshire. That's a problem. He's not winning any additional people. He's not winning independents. He's not winning suburban women. He's not winning many of the Republicans. But on top of that, look at what he did. The day after he talked about revenge the night of the New Hampshire election, what did he do? He said, anybody that supports me is no longer part of MAGA. If you are running for president, your job is to bring more people in. It's a story of addition, not to go and push people out of your club. That's not what a candidate for the president of the United States does. That's somebody who's making it all about himself. This is not about himself. Whether it was the night of the New Hampshire elections, whether it was after his court case that he lost, the problem that I have, at no point did he talk about the American people, Neil. At no point did he talk about the debt that we're in. At no point did he talk about the fact that, you know, our kids need to go back to the basics in education. Only 31 percent are proficient in reading. At no point did he talk about this open border that's out of control. At no point did he talk about the wars that are happening around the world and the fact that we need to prevent war, not start war. He's not talking about anything but himself, and that's the problem. We can't go through four more years of chaos. It's just, we won't survive But I, I know what you've been saying. I know at the polls, uh, and, and they don't look good for you in, in your state of South Carolina, that could change. You, you said a couple of days ago, I hope I'm right about this, I'm not going anywhere, referring to leaving the race, that that's not going 
to happen. Uh, you obviously are raising a great deal of money, $16.5 million in January alone. That's your biggest monthly fundraising total like ever. And it's actually picked up steam uh, post some of these races that, that you lost. So uh, you have good reason financially to stay in it. Uh, but after South Carolina, let's say you don't win there, uh, w what's the justification? You know, you guys said this in Iowa when I had 2% and ended up with 20%. You said this, you know, in New Hampshire when y'all said I was going to be down 20, 25 points and I got 43%. We moved 25 points in the last three weeks of that election. We're now in the three weeks of South Carolina. We're going to work hard. We're going to do everything we can. Why don't we wait until the, the votes in South Carolina? But let me say this, Neil. I'm not going anywhere. We don't do coronations in America. Two states have voted. Two. It's 1,215 delegates to become president. Trump has 32, I have 17. We've got 48 states and more territories that need to vote. Let's let these votes happen. This is not about what about this. If you want to talk about something, talk about the fact that, first of all, I have 250,000 donors from all 50 states. 95% of those are $200 or less. That is the 70 percent of America that don't want a Trump-Biden rematch. It is time for y'all to start hearing those people. The second thing is, it just came out yesterday, Trump spent 50 million of his campaign dollars on legal fees, on personal cases against him. Think about that. That's why he's not on TV in South Carolina. That's why he hasn't been here yet. That's why he's not doing rallies. Is because he's using all the money to pay for his legal fees for his own well, personal cases. Well, he could cases. also be looking at That's his poll numbers, story. governor, and so saying, how do you I don't, defeat... well, he, he, You're right. He could be saying that, you know, I don't need to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm winning by no, country No, what I'm saying is, how do, you defeat, how do you defeat Joe Biden if all of your money is going to legal fees? Tell me that. He, out of his own mouth, said, I'm going to spend more time in a courtroom than I'm going to spend campaigning. That's a problem. Right. That's a problem me, because our country can't the, the wait. Things could change uh, if he were convicted um, now, on any of these various counts. Now, it depends on your point of view. But there's one poll that's interesting, that a felony conviction uh, it gives Joe Biden a seven-point swing. Right now, down two points to Donald Trump. He could be up five points in, in the process. I, I, I guess what the reason why I mentioned that to some voters, I don't know how many, Governor, it's going to make a big difference if he's convicted. Is that what, why you, you stay in this race, just in case he explodes? I'm staying in this race. I mean, the court cases are an issue of itself. I'm staying in this race because Republicans cannot lose another general election. We lost in 2018. We lost in 2020. We lost in 2022. How many more times do you have to lose because of one person before you say maybe this isn't a winning combination? That's why I'm staying in. I'm staying in because I don't want my kids to live like this. Mm. I don't want anybody else's kids to live like this. We've got to start really focusing on what matters. America is too distracted. And when America's distracted, the world is less safe. And we're seeing that play out in front of us. We have to wake up and say, now is the time to right the ship. Now is the time. I have no issues with Donald Trump. I voted for him twice. I was proud to serve America in his administration. This isn't personal for me. Right. This is personal when it comes to the future of my kids. You know, I talk to a lot of Republican operatives all over the party, uh, Governor, and uh, I don't know whether I'm a glutton for punishment. They'll each tell you something different. But they do, uh, even those not supporting you, admire you greatly and your past and your record as a governor, you an ambassador. But they, they, they get a little nervous when you criticize Donald Trump because they think you'd make a great running mate. Now, of course, who knows how that'll go? Um, a lot of people say it would be perfect because you could get him the independence and the kind of support he, he, he would need in a general election. Um, uh, he, he, he seems to rule you out. You seem to rule that out. But if he were to ask, what would you do? I am not interested. I am not interested in being vice president. I am running to be president. I'm running because we have a country to save. And I believe that this is the time to do it. And I am determined to go through whatever pain, whatever bruises, whatever we have to do to get to that point. But even if I it doesn't work out, is even if it. it doesn't work out, and I know, and I know you know, we were very early, and I've mentioned that on this show constantly because I'm, I'm pretty good at numbers. And you're quite right. We're very early. You need 1,215 delegates. No one's even close to that. Having said that, though, if the lineup of matches is such that it doesn't favor you and it, it's looking like an impossible battle 
and you know smarter cooler heads maybe start saying you know Trump you know Haley uh, that that makes sense that that that's a winning ticket what do you say this is what I'll tell you, Neil. I'll let you know. Maybe I'll give you a tip um, or a first heads up when I pick my vice president. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> I had a feeling you're going to answer that way. Well, I, had, I still have you, Ambassador. I do want to get your take on this border bill. Um, you know, Donald Trump has famously said that Republicans who vote for it should be ashamed of themselves. We're, we're going to have Senator Lankford with us shortly, uh, who's amazed at the response it's getting and wondering if maybe that could be because Republicans um, might feel that they're in a better position not to have something like this, uh, that it could help Joe Biden and it wouldn't help them. How are you on this? There's two things going on here, and we have to speak hard truths. First of all, everybody's tired of a do-nothing Congress. I mean, can they do anything? Because we've seen nothing out of Republicans or Democrats. They have an inability to get anything done. The second thing is, you can't have Trump sitting there saying, don't do anything until the election. We have a completely open border. America's acting like it's September 10th, and we better remember what September 12th felt like, because it only takes one person to cross that border to create a 9-11 moment. We need this fix now. We need congressional members to stay in D.C. and not leave until they figure this out. Does that when mean I look this at the measure, border bill, does that mean this measure, Ambassador, I know you said it has warts and some issues like that, but if this is all it's going to be, um, with maybe slight variations, uh, better this than nothing? Well, I think, first of all, we do know what Congress does. When they pass something, then they wipe their hands and say, we already did that. Mm -hmm. If they're going to do this, they need to do it right. The one part I like about this bill is I like that it strengthens the asylum chart, the asylum requirements. That's very important. We haven't had that, and we need that. The part that I don't like about the bill, it doesn't require remain in Mexico, which is very important at keeping them from coming on U.S. soil in the first place, and I don't like the 5,000 limit. We don't want anybody to come in. We can't say only when 5,000 people have crossed the border. They need to stay there. They need to figure this out. They need to adjust it, amend it in any way that they can, and they should not leave D.C. until they get us a border bill. And no, we are not waiting until the general election to do this. And it's irresponsible to say that Congress has to wait until a general election because Trump is worried that that he's going to lose. There's a lot of reasons we got to worry Trump's going to lose, but you don't sacrifice national security to do it. All right. We'll see what happens. Governor, Ambassador, always good seeing you. Thank you for taking the time. Go to NikkiHaley.com and join us. I had a feeling you'd add that. Uh, Nikki Haley on all of that. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.